hand you one, and the ushers will give you one, and let's turn to 2 Kings chapter 22. Kind of canny up here. You can fix that. Canny. 2 Kings chapter 22. Looking again at King Josiah's revival. If you read ahead, I'm sure you were blessed. We'll see how far... Wow, now I don't get nothing. Hello. Now that's really worse. I want to say everybody hi at home who's watching. God bless you guys. I'm trying to get this squared away. But um, 2 Kings chapter 22. Let's pray. Father, thank you, God, for this evening that you've given to us. Sweet time of worship. Time of fellowship, Lord, and... Now time to look to your word, and we ask that you would speak to us, God, as we are uh, obedient just to read through your, chat, through your Bible, Lord. Um, and we ask that you would just speak to us tonight. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. We've seen the kingdom of Judah, uh, which was once part of all of Israel, if you remember, We've seen the kingdoms separate. We've seen the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, and that's what we're speaking of today, of the southern kingdom. Right now, the northern kingdom are in, being occupied by Assyria. But Judah, at this point, has yet to go and be, become occupied by Babylon. But prior to that, we've been studying the kings of the south. That's right. And we've seen this kingdom, I mean, it was ruled by some good kings, right? The last one was well, prior to uh, Josiah was Hezekiah, and then only to be followed by probably the worst of the king, his, his son Manasseh, who did repent, and God did restore him, but the damage, was, the damage of his past evilness was still very much alive and evident. And it was kind of you know, covered, but it was still evident. And last week, we began a study on the reign of Manasseh, his grandson Josiah, who did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, bringing about revival in the land. And, and he'll be the last king that did right before the Lord and do right for Judah prior to them, as I said, taken captive by Babylon. Last time, Josiah ordered the high priest to repair the temple. Revival was in his heart. Revival was... Was, was his goal. And he saw the temple in shambles as it was. And he had the high priest repair the temple, clean it out in order to restore worship. And we pointed out that that's the first place the revival begins, doesn't it? It's, today, our temple is within our heart. We are walking temples of the Holy Spirit. And if we want revival, then it has to begin with us, doesn't it? And so he went in there and he began to repair the temple, he began to restore worship, he began to, you know, clean things out and uh, get things, idols and things of that removed. And there'll be some more cleanup that still needs to be done tonight as we get to it. But as we commented, one of the things that was exciting in doing this is they found the scrolls of God, the Word of God, the Bible. Now, some think it was all the first five books of the Bible, known as the Pentateuch or the Law, Others think it was probably just the book of Deuteronomy. They can argue that. The bottom line is they found the word of God. And we mentioned last week, pretty sad when in the temple you lose the word of God and how that applied even today in the churches that here we have churches that, first of all, they don't even believe in the Bible anymore, let alone even speaking from the Bible or teaching from the Bible. And it's pretty sad when that takes place. But as the Bible was read to the king, he became very, uh, con he became convicted and disturbed at the same time because as he was hearing the word of God, it was convicting him, but he was also hearing that Judah had been ignoring the commandments of God. They had been ignoring the things that God wanted them to do. And in that, he read, no doubt, that there were a, was going to be a curse to those who were disobedient in not keeping what God had written in his word. 
And here we see that in, look at verse 12 with me again. Uh, He commanded them to go into the temple. uh, And now he here is commanding the team here in verse 12 to go inquire of the Lord for me. Uh, He's read the things that Judah was not doing. He's worried for the nation. He's worried for himself, no doubt. And he says, go inquire for, for me, verse 13, for the people and for all of Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is aroused against us because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. So he was very concerned for the nation. And I love that. Not only for himself, but for the nation as well. He took on the responsibility. He's the king. He's the leader. And he wants to lead them into a revival and bring back worship and do the right thing. Deeply moved, he asked the team, go inquire of the Lord concerning Judah's condition. Where would they go inquire? Well, they would go to the prophets. And that's where we pick it up in verse 14. In verse 14, it says, so Hilkiah, who was the, the priest, Hiakam, Agbor, Shaphan, and Isaiah went to Huldah, the prophetess. It's a female prophetess. The wife of Shalom, the son of Tikva, the son of Haras, keeper of the wardrobe. She dwelt in Jerusalem in the second quarter, and they spoke with her, and they shared with her all that was on the king's heart and all that they had read in the scroll of God, in the word of God. Now, there are many prophetesses in the Bible uh, as you read through the scriptures. We know Miriam, who was the, the sister of Moses, is called a prophetess in Exodus 15. Deborah, you can read of her in Judges chapter 4. Huldah here, of course, uh, uh, and uh, another gal named Naodia, if I'm saying her name right, uh, there uh, in Nehemiah 6. Um, and then you have, in the New Testament, you have Anna in Luke 2. Anna as an Old Testament prophet. And then New Testament uh, prophets, uh, those who had the gift of prophecy, you can read of the four daughters of Philip in Acts chapter 21. So, The gift of prophecy can be given, of course, to men or women. Today, it's more forth-telling from the Word of God, being able to discern what God is saying and speak forth for today. Back in the Old Testament, it was more, uh, uh, was it foretelling? Foretelling and foretelling. So, interesting when you read that. So, let's look at verse 15 and, and just read what she has to say. And then she said to them, thus says the Lord God of Israel, tell the man who sent you to me, thus says the Lord, behold, I will bring calamity on this place and on its inhabitants, all the words of the book which the king of Judah has read, because they have forsaken me and burned incense to other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands, and therefore my wrath shall be aroused against this place and shall not be quenched. Now you can just imagine the teams there listening to. Oh my! Oh no, man! Oh God! You know, uh, you know, this is this is what's going to happen. Well, let me tell you something, guys. God's word will stand true. God is going to keep His promises. He's going to keep His word, and He's going to bring judgment, as the prophet has said, on on the nation. Somebody said this, it doesn't do any good to warn your kids about the consequences of their disobedience if you never follow through with discipline or punishment. And that's true. Those of us who are parents, we know that, right? Uh, Sometimes we give them a, a, you know, a pass, but eventually we've got to bring the punishment, right? And of course, it's got to be a balance point. You're grounded for a year. I mean, you know, or we, we say those kinds of things, right? Uh, but it doesn't do any good if we don't follow through. And here, God is just following through his word. But some may say, well, where's the grace in this? I mean, they found the word of God. They found the scrolls. They're, they're, they're convicted. You know, uh, how about that? Well, well, well look, look at verse 18. 
But as for the king of Judah, and I'm sure the guy's heart's just, oh, thank you, God. Who sent you to inquire of the Lord in this manner, you shall speak to him. Thus says the Lord God of Israel. Now she's prophesying. Concerning the words which you have heard. Number one. Now watch this, guys. This is application for us too tonight. Verse 19. Because your heart was what? Tender. And number two. You humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I spoke against this place and against, against its inhabitants, that they would become a desolation, a curse. And you, number three, tore your clothes. Again, that was the outward. We saw that last week. That was the outward action of what was going on within the king's heart. And number four, you wept before me. That's the inward. So the outward was the tearing of the, tearing of the clothes. The inward was the weeping, the true weeping, the and he says, I also have heard you, says, says the Lord. So, so God knew Josiah's heart and how it told on himself, you know, as he was listening to God's word, how, how that double-edged sword was doing the work on his heart in his life. And then not only for himself, again, for the, for the nation. And, and he, he told on himself through the humility and the repentance. And he loved being there used by God. And he loved the nation that he was to rule. And God loves Israel as well. And he still does. As we should be praying for Israel on a daily basis. A lot of things going on even right now. But notice again, I want to go over this as an application. Number one, his heart was tender. And as I read these things off, as what the Lord has spoken to me, ask yourself, is that where I'm at, God? Do you still need to tenderize my heart? Am I, am I tender? The heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. God saw his heart. God knew his heart. This is, a, this is a good king. This is a really good king who truly cared and loved the Lord God. The heart controls our thoughts. The heart controls, controls our emotions. The heart controls our will. Wiersbe says the heart is the master control unit of the body. That's so true. And God goes right to the heart. And he knew his heart through this. But it was the word of God that, again, that, that shook him up. It was the word of God that convicted him. It was that sword of the spirit that came and started working upon him. Number two, again, he humbled himself. Guys, that is a sign of brokenness. That is a sign of brokenness of self. So if you're saying, is, is my, Lord, tonight, is my heart tender? Am I, is my heart open to you, Lord? Am I, is, or is my heart stiff? If, 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 is it hard? Because as the tenderness of the heart goes, so goes brokenness of self. And then, of course, continuing on, he tore his clothes. The express, that's the expression of deep conviction of sin, deep conviction. And then the repentance, he wept before God, a sign of repentance. Oh, we are we going before God? Are we repenting before God? Are we keeping, as I like to say, short lists with God? So important. Keep short lists with God. Psalm 51, 17 says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, right? A broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. Many of the people at the time also, and even in the times of Christ, well, sure, they would bring their offering. The, they would bring the bull. You know, oh, that guy really messed up. Look at he's bringing a bullock. But the fact is, is on the way to the altar, God expected the leader, the man, the husband, the leader, as he's walking with this animal, to realize what is going to take place. That, that this, this, this animal is going to be killed and slaughtered and is going to be offered for that man, his family, his, his family's sins. And there should, that walk, as you're walking, as you're going toward the altar, there should be that time of brokenness, of humbleness, of realizing, you know, just what is going to take place. God says, look it, I don't want those sacrifices I want you to be broken. I want your heart to be contrite and humble because all you're going is through the process. You're just going because, you know, and that's how legalism really got, you get caught up in, in legalism and things like that. 
And God said, I don't want your sacrifices. That was God's grace, though, looking upon the king's heart. And now for his mercy, look at verse 20 of chapter 22. Surely, therefore, here's his, here's his mercy. I will gather you to your fathers, and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace. And your eyes shall not see all the calamity which I will bring on this place. So that's God's mercy. He says, I am going to do what I said I'm going to do. The curse is still upon Judah. I am going to come against them. But he says, it's not going to be during your lifetime. I'm not, I'm not going to do it. You're going to be gathered to your grave in peace, although he'll die in battle. We'll see that, I think, next week. But he says, I will bring peace upon this. As long as the king lives, the nation lives in peace. Because so go the king, so go the country, so go the leadership, so go the people. And God says, I'm not going to bring this. I'm not going to bring this curse upon the people. And we know it's the captivation from Babylon. Not until you die. So that's kind of a good word. And then it says there, so they brought back the word to the king. And I'm sure he's like blessed by that. All right, awesome, man. You know, thank you, God. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for, you know, holding back on that on that curse until, you know, at least my reign. And this is what I want to do. And, and this is revival is going on. But there's more to Josiah's reign in the story. Looking now at chapter 23, let's continue. Verse 1. Now the king sent them to gather all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem to him. And the king went up to the house of the Lord with all the men of Judah. And with him all the inhabitants of Jerusalem the priests and the prophets and all the people, both small and great. And he read in their hearing the words of the book of the covenant, which had been found in the house of the Lord. He's having a Bible study, man. He's going to read what he read to them or was read to him. He's going to personally now get the scroll and read to the people. And as we said, every king should have had their own scroll of the scripture with them. It seems here that he's got that now. And he wants to read to the people all of the word. And maybe it was just Deuteronomy. Who knows? But he wants to read to them because he knows the importance of hearing the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and that by what? The word of God. So many scriptures we can talk about how important the word of God is. And so uh, he gathers all these people. He gathers Judah, man. He starts with the leadership. He starts with the spiritual leadership. He starts with the men who will help him lead the people, small and great. And he, and he reads in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant that they found in the house of the Lord. Verse 3, then the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes And here it is, with all his heart, all his soul, and to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. And all the people took took a stand for the covenant. So after hearing God's word, after even reading the curse that is placed upon Judah for their backslidden, uh, you know, state, and also no doubt... uh, the words that Huldah, the prophetess, had given to him. Uh, here we see that he reads this, and the people, it says, stand for the covenant. They, that's their amen. Now, we know again, <laughs> if you read ahead, that that amen didn't stay for so long with the people. Eventually, they would revert back to their sinful nature. But at this place, or at this time, at least they will have uh, leadership that is um, revived and strong for the Lord, strong for God. I mean, how great would that be to be in a, uh, under a nation that, that the leadership are broken before God and walking with the Lord? I mean, I love it. 
But at least now they have a king who reads the word of God and reads the word of God to them. And he's just praying and hoping that they would turn their ways. Well, at this point, they they stand with him. They took a stand for the covenant. I mean, yeah, we will do that as well. Guys, getting on, listen, this might be for somebody. Getting on track or getting back on the right path always starts by getting back to the word of God. And getting back to the Lord. Getting back to the word of God. The Bible is our great GPS because it shows us where we have fallen. Psalm 119, 105, what is that? Your word is a lamp to my feet, right? And a light to my path. If you found yourself off path, get back to the word of God. Get back to the scriptures to read his precious word. It's breathing, right? You can even hear it. But it's... It's, it's his word, man, to us. This is the way he communicates with us. The word of God, the scriptures. We put it in our heart and he speaks to us throughout the day and shows us examples and applications. I've told you that many times. You're blown away. You're just blown away. So this is the great GPS to get ourselves back on the path and he knew that, the king knew that. Bring me the scroll, I'm gonna read it. I'm gonna read it to all the nation. Imagine I'm going to pray that their conviction is like my conviction. I'm going to pray that that God just begins to work upon the people as well. But verse 3, it says, Then the king stood by the pillar and made a covenant before the Lord. Again, number one, to follow the Lord, to keep his commandments, keep his statutes with all his heart and all his soul. And so we move on. And we'll get back to that because he's going to repeat that. The writer of 2 Kings is going to repeat that. Look at verse 4 through 14. We're just going to read right through. You ready? And the king commanded Hilkiah, the high priest, the priest of the second order, and the doorkeepers to bring out of the temple of the Lord all of the articles that were made for Baal. Now, I want you to see what's coming out of the, the temple of God. A place where, as we said last week, God said, I will dwell. So, the articles that were made for Baal, for Asherah, and for all the host of heaven. And he burned them outside of Jerusalem in the fields of Kidron, in the fields of Kidron, and carried their ashes to Bethel. Then he removed the idolatrous priests whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense on the high places in the cities of Judah and in the places all around Jerusalem, and those who burned incense to Baal to the sun, to the moon, to the constellations, and to all the hosts of heaven. And he brought out the wooden images from the house of the Lord to the brook Kidron outside of Jerusalem and burned it at the brook Kidron and the ground, uh, burned, burned it at the brook Kidron and ground it to ashes and threw its ashes on the graves of the common people. It's those who worship them. Those who are, had, had yet has, had died, he, he puts their ashes. You want to worship here? You can have these. Verse 7. Then he tore down the ritual booths of the perverted persons. Those are the male temple prostitutes that were in the house of the Lord. Where the cities of Judah and, uh, or uh, where the woman wove hangings for the wooden image. Those are pornographic tapestries. And he brought all the priests from the cities of Judah and defiled the high places where the priests had burned incense from Geba to Beersheba. Also, he broke down the high places at the gates, which were at the entrance of the gate of Joshua, the governor of the city, which were to the left of the city gate. Nevertheless, the priests of the high palaces did not come up to the altar of the Lord in Jerusalem because they were disqualified to serve at the temple. But notice, they ate unleavened bread among their brethren. So they were brought back among the priests, but they were not qualified anymore to serve at the temple. Uh, verse 10, And he defiled Topheth, which is in the valley of son of Hinnom, that no man might make his son or his daughter pass through the fire to Molech. No more birth abortions. Praise God. Then he removed the horses that the kings of the Judah had dedicated to the sun at the entrance to the house of the Lord by the chamber of Nathan Melek, the officer who was in the court, and he burned the chariots of of the sun with fire. The altars that were on the roof 
the upper chamber of Ahaz, which the kings of Judah had made, and the altars which Manasseh had made, and two courts of the house of the Lord, the king broke down and pulverized there, and threw their dust into the brook Kidron. Then the king defiled the high places that were east of Jerusalem, which were on the south of the Mount of Corruption, which Solomon, king of Israel, had built for Ashtoreth, the abomination of the Sidonians, for Chemosh, the abomination of the Moabites, for Milcom, the abomination of the people of Ammon. These were all the gods at one time Solomon was serving and and given to the people to serve as well. Verse 14, And he broke in pieces the sacred pillars and cut down the wooden images and filled their places with the bones of men, defiling them. Guys, this is a total cleanup. This is a, all that to say, this is cleaning house. This is a total cleanup. This is getting the temple right. So important for us to have our temple right, isn't it? If there's any idols in our temple, you know the scriptures, Lord, remove those idols. But if there's anything other than you that I'm serving and worshiping, Lord, remove them. Lord, forgive me. I mean, this is a great example of, uh, of what is taking place, you know, uh, with cleaning the temple out to what really has taken place in the heart of this king. And he prays it would be in the heart of all his leadership, all his priests, and all of Judah. But unfortunately, we will know that that's not will not be true for all of them. But I pray it's true for us. And I pray that we lean upon the grace and the mercy of God tonight. And if there'll be anything within us that needs to be cleansed, that we will take care of business before we leave here tonight. I totally just go before God. And if there's anything, guys, it's not worth holding on to. It's not worth it. As we said in the Sunday, one of Sunday's sermons, you know, it's just a distraction. It's just a constantly... Uh, you know, if your shoes are untied and you're constantly stumbling over and tripping yourself, tie your shoe, right? Well, if this is the case, then repent. Go before God, broken. Say, remove these things, God. I don't need them. And this is, man, they just cleaned house, right? What a trip. But then he moves to Bethel, which is interesting because Bethel is north. And really, it's in, is, it's in the, the northern part. But he wants to even go f- as far north as he can to remove the, you know, the, the, the evilness there and the wickedness that is there. So he moves north into Israel, Samaria territory. Remember, Samaria was the headquarters of the northern kingdom when they split. And so it says there, verse 15, moreover, the altar that was at Bethel. Now, remember, two altars were built uh, by Jeroboam to keep the people of Israel from coming to Jerusalem because there was only one temple, right? Only one place that God says, you must worship me and you worship me here. So Jeroboam was smart. He says, well, I'll put two temples and tell them to worship these calves, these calves. And remember he said, this is your God, Israel. What blasphemy. So at least he goes to Bethel. Today, Dan, the northern country, today you can go and visit the temple that Jeroboam erected for the people. You can actually go there and they have these steel bars and they kind of show you how, how, what it looked like. He didn't go that far, but at least he went to Bethel. And, and the high places which Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel sin, had made both that altar and the high place he broke down and he burned the high place and crushed it to powder and burned the wooden image. As Josiah turned, he saw the tombs that were there on the mountain and he sent and he took the bones of those who worship, the bones, those people who died and worship there out of the tombs and burned them on the altar and defiled it. I mean, he just, he's just going for it, huh? Uh, it says here that um, according to the word of the Lord, which the man of God proclaimed, uh, who proclaimed these words. Now, it's interesting here that we see that he's speaking of a past prophecy that is now coming to pass and it was Josiah that was the one that was prophesied that was going to do exactly what verses 15 here and 16 and so on tell us. It's in 1 Kings chapter 13 if I may remind you of our study there in verse 1 and 2. 
And there it says, and behold, a man of God went from Judah. It was an anonymous prophet, if you remember. And he went to Bethel by the word of the Lord. And Jeroboam, who was the king of the north, stood by the altar to burn incense. Incense at that profane altar that he built. Verse 2, of First Kings 13. Then he cried out against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, behold, a child, Josiah by name, shall be born to the house of David, and on you he shall sacrifice the priests of the high places who burn incense on you, and men's bones shall be burned on you. Now, that's 300 years before this took place, what we're reading at now, in 2 Kings 23. And yet it was prophesied. And we mentioned to when we were in 1 Kings that not even prophecy would move Jeroboam's heart to repentance, to break things down, to get things right. You know, and, and so that prophecy was given 300 years and now we're before and now we're reading about it. And it's coming to pass. God's word is, is coming to pass and it will. So that's exactly what he did. He crushed it to powder. He, and then he, he got into the tombs and he took the bones and, and he burned them on the altar, just like the prophecy said. Well, verse 17, it says, Then he, Josiah, said, well, What gravestone is that I see? And so the men of the city told him, It is the tomb of the man of God, that prophet who prophesied about him coming 300 years earlier who came from Judah and proclaimed these things which you have done against the altar of Bethel. That must have blown him away. And he said, well, let him alone. Let no one move his bones. And so they left his bones alone with the bones of the prophet who came from Samaria. Now Josiah also took away all the shrines of the high places that were in the cities of Samaria, which the kings of Israel had made to provoke the Lord to anger. And he did it to, he did to them according to all the deeds he had done in Bethel. He executed all the priests of the high places who were there, all the altars, the burnt men's bones on them. He burned the men's bones on them. And he returned to Jerusalem. To Jerusalem. Sometimes, you know, there's things we need to take care of in our life. And there may be, you know, things that are outside, like I said before, the, maybe it's your cell phone, maybe it's your computer, maybe whatever it is, maybe you're flirting around with somebody, and you know you need, not to, you need to get rid of it all, not only within your heart, the lusts, but also as we talked about Sunday, whatever it is that we're dealing, we need to get rid of it all, man. He went outside of Jerusalem, he went to Bethel, he says, I don't want anything to stumble the people, I'll go as far as Samaria, I'll go as far as Bethel. And we'll destroy all that. And we'll come back. And that's what he did. And he came back to Jerusalem. Interesting thing. Look at verse 21 with me of chapter 23. This is cool. Then the king commanded all the people saying, keep the Passover to the Lord your God as it is written in this book of the covenant. I love it, man. You know, no doubt on his way back to Jerusalem, he's got his scroll with him. He's just reading. Remember being born again? Remember when you first got saved, man? You couldn't put the Bible down. You know, they didn't have, pod, well, I guess they do now, but back in the 80s, they didn't have podcasts or anything. We had cassettes. How many of you remember cassettes? And I remember when we got here in, in Virginia in 92, I had all of Chuck Smith's cassettes and I had to drive from Fredericksburg to Andrews Air Force Base every day I'll tell you it's 65 miles one way 100 was 130 miles round trip on the 95 95 wasn't as bad but they had that mixing bowl that they that one day they were going to get finished which it's finally finished but it's not working but anyway so man I just tape after tape that was my seminary guys just listening to Chuck, and after Chuck, Jack Hibbs. I had a whole, whole, the whole Bible by Jack Hibbs on cassette, tape after tape, just listening. I, I just wanted the word. I just wanted to continue being the word, you know, and just, just excited. So, you know, this is me. I probably think that as he's coming back to Jerusalem, he's reading his scroll. Oh, man, that's another thing we forgot to do. How could we forget the Passover? 
How quickly people forgot. And so, he says, again, keep the Passover to the Lord your God as it is written in this book. Verse 22, such a Passover surely had never been held since the days of Judges, guys. Since the days of Judges. Now we know Manasseh, uh, under his reign, he did he 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 kept the Passover, but he couldn't really keep it on the days and the months that it was supposed to. But at least he tried, right? And that was a hundred years prior to Josiah becoming king. But a true Passover with with as per the word of God, as per the scriptures, since judges, since uh, who judged Israel, nor in all the days of the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah. Verse 23, but in the 18th year of King Josiah, this Passover was held before the Lord in Jerusalem. We're going to do it right, man. We're going to do things right. They hadn't had celebrated a Passover, as I said, since King Hezekiah's reign over 100 years earlier. So let's talk about the Passover. Why was it important? Why do you think the king said, this is important. We've got to, we, we've got to celebrate this. We, we've got to go forth. We've got to get ready, and we have to keep the Passover. Well, the Passover reminded the Jews of God's redemption and deliverance. Redemption and deliverance, and that was from Egypt, right, in the days of Moses. I love the verses in Exodus chapter 3, verse 7 when God told Moses at the burning bush, and the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Verse 8. So I underlined this. Open your Bibles, if you can, to Exodus 3, 8. So I have come down to deliver them. I remember teaching this, and I've never seen that verse before. I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, and so on. It it just speaks so much of what God has done for us. Judah's neglect of the Passover proved that they had neglected to remember the Lord's work of redemption for them out of Egypt. Moses gave captive Israel instructions on the first Passover in Exodus 12. God told Israel to sacrifice a spotless, spotless, unblemished lamb and then you take its blood and you mark the doorposts and the lintels with its blood. Then, when the Lord passed through the nation, he would pass over the household that showed the blood and the firstborn would live. You guys know that, right? Not go study it, man. It's, it's amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing there in, in, in Exodus 12. But in a very real way, the blood of the Lamb saved the Israelites from death. As it kept the plague from entering their home. Why? Because they were obedient to God. And they did exactly what the word said, exactly what Moses said for them to do. Take that lamb, take its blood, put it on the, on the doorway, and you will be saved from this plague because it's coming. And God says what he means and means what he says, right? And the Israelites were saved from the plague, and their firstborn children stayed alive. Now someone to be asked, is it fair of God that one's firstborn should die? if they didn't do that. Is that fair? Well, now we, we want to realize this, that let's not forget that God required this of himself. You say, what's that? Well, under the new covenant, he sent his only son down to deliver us. He gave his son, who is the unblemished lamb of God, he who knew no sin, the sinless one, Jesus, to die for our sins. And we should not forget that. We should not forget that. We should not be like them who forgot the Passover. Imagine that. 
So Jesus' blood was spilt on two wooden beams and like the doorposts and the lintels or the support beams that they were to put the blood upon, we call it a cross. And that cross redeemed us from the plague. The plague is what? S-I-N, sin. Because we were all S-I-N positive from sin and kept us, which kept us captive in our Egypt, which kept us captive and separated us from God. And Jesus died at Passover, fulfilling the old covenant sacrificial system and bringing the new covenant under grace. And that's why Paul tells us as well. He tells us of Jesus' words concerning the Lord's Supper. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in what? In remembrance of me. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. We have to be reminded at communion of what Christ has done for us. It breaks us. It humbles us. If you're truly understanding communion understanding the Lord's Supper. When Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, he indicated this was a a ceremony that must be continued in the future. We must remember him or we will forget how precious his death was and how precious our life is with him. Passover looked forward to the coming of the Lamb of God when they celebrated it. And communion proclaims the Lord's death until he comes again. And he will come again because he has promised us. Let's wrap it up there in verse 24 and 25. Verse 24 says, Moreover, Josiah put away those who consulted mediums and spiritists, Uh, the household gods and the idols, all the abominations that were seen in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem, that he might perform the words of the law which were written in the book that Hilkiah the priest found in the house of the Lord. And now before him there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his might, according to the law of Moses nor after him did any arise like him. That's awesome. The author of Second Kings describes Josiah by referencing Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. No doubt reading that and realizing that's who I want to be. Lord, that's, that's, that's what, who I want to be, God. I want to love you, God, with all my heart, soul, and my strength. And, and that continues on even into the Gospels, even into the New Testament. There in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they reference Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5 for us. We, we should desire to love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, and all our strength. And you know what that speaks of? A relationship. When you have a relationship, you're giving your all, or well, you should be. How much more to God? How much more to the Lord? And as that proves out, and as that shows, that fruit begins to, you begin to bear that fruit, man. I'm telling you, it's so awesome. No, we're not perfect, and that's why we can go and, and repent. And, but that's what he desires of us to love him that way, and to remember him, to remember all that he's done. Let's pray. So, Father, thank you, God, for this time in your word, Lord, and and the opportunity of of reading, God, and and studying and understanding. I pray you go beyond my notes, God, that you've spoken to us individually, congregationally, Lord, that as we always ask. And, And we pray, God, 
We pray that we'd leave here different than the way we came, Lord. Lord, just knowing more and understanding more, God. You know us, Lord. You know, you know every one of us. You know every intricate part of our heart. You know everything that we've done, God. And that's good, Lord. And we want you to keep knowing us that way, Lord. And keep helping us and guiding us. And that's it in Jesus' name, amen.